Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am so happy to see you all here. I'm so happy to be presenting this for Barnes and Noble and Penguin Random House. Um, real quick, uh, do a quick introduction introduction of myself so that you're not all going, who's this strange man talking to Laurel? Um, my name is William McCaskey. I am the author of Dragon 2-0, uh, also the co-editor of best-selling anthology Fantastic Hope that Laurel and I worked on together. And then I was a contributing author to Freehold Defiance Anthology. It's a little bit about me. Um, before we introduce Laurel, I do want to remind everyone that if you're here tonight, it means you ordered a signed copy of Smolder. So thank you very much. Um, your signed books will be mailed after the event. You'll receive them about eight to 10 days, um, eight to 10 business days after tonight. So Laurel, tell us who you are. Well, if you don't know who I am, I think you're in the wrong uh, uh, meeting or whatever. Um, I am Laurel K. Hamilton. I am best known for the Anita Blake Vampire Hunter series. And we are here celebrating that the 29th book in that series has come out. And it is the 30th anniversary year for the Anita Blake series, which is amazing to me. Um, I also uh, have written the Meredith Gentry series, and there will be more in that series before you ask. And also, I have the first book in the Zaniel Havelock series, A Terrible Fall of Angels, which came out uh, last year. Last year? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, real quick, before we get started into uh, Laurel and I talking, um, there is a Q&A uh, module that you can type your questions into. The way that I have it set up right now is I have it set to most upvotes. So please take a look in the questions that have already been asked. And if you see something that is, you know, just lights your little heart on fire and you want to know the answer, uh, hit a thumbs up so it pops to the top and we'll uh, we'll get to that. So Laurel, I guess the first question to start the discussion off tonight is, what is Smolder about? Uh, Smolder is about power. It is the power play between couples. It is the power play between uh, good and evil. It is about the fact that when power is involved in any relationship, that it's not really possible to be equal. It's not a balance. It is a tug of war about who is going to have the most power in a given situation. And um, and it took me a while to realize that this is a book about, about power and how that works in every relationship from the most intimate to the most dangerous. I like, I like that you worded it that way. It's, it's, that it's a tug of war and it's a give and take that, and it's situational dependence. So there's not always one person in power. And as situations change, another person may step up to be the one in charge. And that's an awesome way of saying it. And I love that. And by the way, if you've read the book or are reading the book, no spoilers. Um, yes. And no, uh, I actually have finished it, which very entertaining read. I loved it. Um, and I will say that one of the things that I noticed is that the power that you talk about is not just physical power. It's not just strength, but it's also intelligence and wisdom, which is highlighted extremely well uh, between two characters. And I thought that was an absolutely fantastic way to do so. Thank you. Um, it, it, people too often talk about balance in a relationship. But uh, is someone who's been, uh, I know we're both married, and the longer you're married, the more you know that you sometimes, it, you go up and down because it depends on what's happening on the other side. And I think that we don't really look at every other relationship the same way, but it is, it's all, it, it, it's all that way, that there's never 100% that one person's in charge as much or one person's needs are here, it, it, it flows. It comes and goes up and down. As long as there isn't a power display where one side is getting no, no help whatsoever and always one person up. In fact, if it gets stuck that way, you're in trouble. And it's also really interesting because I know that you're out as polyamorous and seeing that dynamic shift between Anita, Jean-Claude, all of her her extended polycule is that can't be easy to write 
it isn't easy to write. Um, if I had, if Anita, no, it's not. It's not. And in reality, in reality, the most I've ever been able to date in one year was five different people. And that includes my husband, because you always include your spouse. Whether you're poly or not poly, you better always include your spouse in the dating. Um, and Anita's polycule is actually so complicated that the only thing that allows it to, to work is that everybody's working their issues. And in real life, that's one of the hardest things to do is to get everybody to get into their, their therapy working issues and be very honest and open with communication. But Polly's all about that. That and calendars. What's your schedule? What's your schedule? That that communication and scheduling for polyamory. So are we going to see Anita and Jean-Claude break out the Google Calendar? You know, they should. Uh, they should, but it, it just, there's never going to be a time. I, I don't think there's ever going to be a time in the books where we're going to break out that scheduling thing. Uh, we always have the date already scheduled and done. Uh, I might do a vignette about what it's really like and have them sit there and all get their little calendars out uh, if I did like for a newsletter or something, but I don't think it'll make it in a book. I just think it's funny you talking about a vignette. The last vignette that I saw you work on was Jason and that turned into a full novel. So. Ah, I never saw, I never said that was a vignette. I thought it was a short story. Vignette is just just a tiny little bit, and it's just something that that usually gets cut from a book. And some of it's really interesting, but there's no place to put it in the book. But yes, Jason was supposed to be a short story, and it turned into a whole book. This is true. So we've we've talked. You talked kind of about therapy and the communication bit, which sounds like you're using some of your own experiences as research um, into how. Anita and Jean-Claude and Micah and the whole cast of characters that I'm not going to try and name right now. Um, but what other research went into this book? Well, um, I'm trying the research, some of the research I did for this book actually might give away a plot point if you're not very far into the book or haven't started it. So I, I am actually debating on, on how much I can mention. Um, I researched uh, historic costuming. I researched uh, Greek myth. I actually, before I settled on where I stayed on the myth, I also uh, looked into uh, Filipino myth and folklore, but I'm saving that for another book. Um, and I, I always, I also research anything I can if there was a weapon that was used in the book, I tried, I, it's either one I've already used or at least lay my hands on and interact with because I find that I always learn something new about that. Um, and I went back and reread some of my own books in preparation as well, which is so I could make notes and go, this character hasn't been on stage in a long time. What did I say? What was their relationship? That kind of thing. Because, I mean, this is the 29th book. I have been writing the series for 30 years. I do not remember everything I wrote. I just don't. There's no way for me to remember it all. And um, some of the fans that read the series each time before a book comes out, my hat is off to you, by the way. That is, a, that is thank you so much for, for doing that. But you guys now know better, more trivia than I do. I would lose, if you were playing Anita Trivia, some of you guys that have been reading the series each time a new book comes out, I would bet on you. I would bet you would remember things that I did not. One of the things I picked up on there is the, the Filipino mythology research, which you know lights a fire in my heart because Raphael and the rats are a favorite of mine. Um, and we know that Filipino equals the rats primarily so. Well, Filipino, Hispanic, uh, you yeah. know, uh, if you look at the Philippines, you you almost can't do the history of the Philippines. You really can't do the history of the Philippines without talking about Spain and the Spanish right. and and other other influences. That was well, one of the things I, yeah. You and, and I, have, you and I have been at the same the same seminars with Guru where he talks yes. about Filipino DNA being found in Central America and Aztec being found in the Philippines, which is sorry, I'm a history geek, so. <laughs> Well, and and we both do we both do Filipino martial arts. We both do FMA. So yes, we both have a great love and respect for it, and it has become very important to both of us. So yes, yes, we both do our research. 
Um, you, you actually, uh, you research, you research anything you love as hard as I do. So yeah. Um, I just research everything like that. So researching everything, have you gone and tried on wedding dresses for Anita? No, and I won't. <laughs> um, I hated it the first time or in the second time doing it myself. Um, I will look up, I've been researching wedding dresses for her to wear different styles. I've actually been looking at film and reading up on royal weddings over the centuries. And uh, I can't believe I'm having to look at royal weddings because that's insane. Uh, but but the level of opulence that I feel like Jean-Claude would want is that. And Anita has become the yes dear. He, he comes with an idea. She's become the yes dear. Um, uh, we're... What happens in Slay and what happens, sorry, what happens in Smolder? Sorry, I'm already, I, I wrote these two books very close together because I I was on a roll. I was hot. I was ready to go. And I wanted, so I actually a little fuzzy on which happens in which book. I'll be honest with that because I wrote them so close together. And um, I am very excited to, that, that 29th book is here, Smolder. Can I can I say it yet, or is it too soon? Uh, I think it's too soon. Okay, but Smolder is the 29th book, and it's so I wrote the next book right after it. I didn't even clean off the decks in my office. I, I often describe my office, the desk, as like the the like a battleship, like a fighter ship, fight, you know, with the fighter planes. If you have a crash, you have to clean it off before you can do the next plane. I usually clean off in between because I wreck my office. It's a disaster by the time I finish because I have paper and notes and everything. I didn't even clean it off before I added another layer and wrote the next book um, because I just, I was too impatient. I was ready to go. And um, so, uh, so I, I am looking at weddings. Weddings have, and really opulent weddings. And I have to say, I didn't know you could spend that much on a wedding. I did not know it was possible to spend that much on a wedding. Um, I, 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 I've seen some price tags on some weddings that I just, I was flabbergasted. I was like, you could run a third world country and not a small one for this much money for a year or two. Um, Anita must never know how much all this costs. It would freak her out. There, there is one part that, and I've, I've heard you, make this comment before there's a part where Anita's in the heels and she's absolutely cut in her head. She's, she's going over, how can I run? How can I, how can I fight? What can I do in these? And the level of detail that you take working down to that point. And I saw somebody ask this question. This is going to be the first question I, I, I ask from a fan. Um, are you considering when you're designing Anita's wedding dress? Are you considering her being able to be armed in some form or fashion? Oh, absolutely. She wouldn't be comfortable without that. Um, I'm sorry. I, the wedding is becoming a political hot hot potato. That's part of the problem. The hate groups, um, the hate groups are becoming more and more serious, and the politics are becoming more troubling in Anita's world around the idea of uh, the supernatural citizens. So they're going to have to have extra security. And everybody keeps asking, are we going to have the heads of some of the other, like some of the other vampires there? And all I can keep thinking is if we have all the most powerful vampires in the country in one place at one time, it just, it just screams target rich environment. So uh, some people may not get an invite to the wedding just so that it won't, it won't be so dangerous and everybody get taken out at once. So I've been debating right. that actually. From a security standpoint, that's actually, I mean, that's going to be a nightmare in and of itself to write and consider. So um, hats off to you. A ab um, absolutely. It's going to be terrible. Shall we start with questions from the fans? Yes, please. Okay. So the first one with, this one's got 23 upvotes. Is there anything you wanted and needed to be able to do in your books, current or future, that the publishers have denied you? No. That, that's a simple and easy one. No. 
I, I, I know you wanted that to be more wholesome, but, <laughs> but, but no, um, I'm, I'm very lucky. I've actually been talking to some of the younger writers that have been coming up, um, talking to them privately and online and stuff. And um, I think part of it is that I carved out, you know, the genre. And so by the time that the, some of the younger writers are getting me told no on certain things that I never got told no on. And I think it may just be the timing uh, I'm successful, so I, I don't get told no as much. Well, that you also kind of blazed the trail. So you were you were the one cutting the path through, and you just demolished mountains that were in your way. So I did, and I think I I, I do have that kind of unstoppable force mentality. That's true. Yes. Uh, all right. Next question. Will we be seeing more Jean-Claude fighting, whether it's physical or metaphysical, with this new enemy threatening them? I'm sorry. Repeat that, please. Will we be seeing more of Jean-Claude fighting, whether physical uh, or metaphysical, with the new enemy threatening them? Um. Yes. Yes, we will. We will be, but not trying to think what not to give away. Um, yes, we will, but not in the way you think. And I, I can't give away, I'm trying not to give away. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking I'm thinking this book and another in a book ahead. So I don't want to give anything away. Um, and uh, I did at one point, he is starting to practice uh, sword again because, and, I had one fan say, you know, he wasn't perfect enough and now you're going to make him a great swordsman. And I said, he was a great swordsman before he died. That's not my, that I didn't, that was already in his canon. You just haven't seen it on stage yet. Um, let's find another question. Let me just scroll down here. Oh, this is a good one. Do your characters ever fight you on where you want to go in the plot? If so, how do you resolve the issue? My characters fight me a lot. Well, I shouldn't say that. Some characters fight me a lot. Um, sometimes the characters fight me so much that I just give up. Uh, Richard has been a character over the years. I meant Anita and Richard both have fought me the most over the years. Um, Jean-Claude just gets his way. It's not that he fights me. It's just that he kind of sits back and goes, I, I know how this is going to work. I he has He has a better feel sometimes for the other characters than I do, strangely. And, um, but Anita used to fight me early on and as she's beginning to work her issues and I don't know, we, she and I both are getting better therapy. So as it goes along, um, and, but yes, uh, the characters do fight me. And if they come up with a better idea, if it is in its truer to their character, I will follow that rabbit hole and most of the time, the rabbit hole leads to Wonderland and better. It's a better idea than I came up with. Every once in a while, it leads you down to a dark place with rabbit poo. And you know you have to go right back to the main thing. But the character usually is quiet after that because I tried. I tried to follow where they wanted to lead, and it didn't work. Or it didn't work for this book. And sometimes it ends up being another book. Indeed it does. Indeed it does. <laughs> One of my favorite things about writing a series is just because it didn't fit into this book doesn't mean you can't put it in the next book or even it spawns its own book, a new book entirely. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm getting some you, double questions here. Um, do you want me to chat over you until you have a question? Uh, actually, Mia, real quick, I'm actually, I'm hitting the, I'm addressing a fan in the chat real quick. Um, we are hitting the questions that get the most upvotes because those are the ones that people tend to want to see the answers to. However, I am reading down to the lower questions as well, just so I get a chance to answer everyone. Um, so that Laurel has a, everybody can get a chance to have one of their questions answered from Laurel. I may not get to everyone and I apologize for that, um, but that's, that's how I'm running it. What does the future well, oh, okay. What does the future of Anita Blake look like? Will you write for as long as there are fans, or do you already know what the end of the series looks like? I think of the Anita series as a mystery series. And if you're, if fantasy series usually have an end point, science fiction fantasy series usually have an end point. 
Mystery series, as a general rule, do not. They will go on uh, indefinitely with the character. And that's how I see Anita. Um, when I, uh, I am very blessed that the series is popular enough that that people want to have wanted to follow me along for 30 years. And, you know, if they do it another 30 years and I'm still having fun and you guys are still having fun, then I will continue writing. I, I have no plans to stop. Um, I'm still having a great time and discovering new things about my, the characters and my world. Oh, here's one. Will Olaf ever become Anita's lion to call? I hope not. <laughs> I I hope not. Um, he is uh, he is one of the more disturbing characters, and I really thought he'd be dead by now. Honest to God, I did. I I I created him to see if I could create a serial killer character that could be an ongoing character and a successful member of the team. I did that, but I really thought that he would misbehave to a point where Anita or Edward would have to kill him by now. And the fact that he keeps surviving in book after book shocks me. So speaking of Edward, so one of the fans notices or thinks that Edward and Ted's personalities seem to be merging. Is that intentional or is that just the evolution of Edward? I think it's partially that Edward, that Ted was probably parts of himself that he had lost over the years through military and, and his assassin being an assassin and then being, being, and for some people are brand new to the series. I had somebody, I had somebody recently uh, just last night at, at the lie at the in-person thing here in St. Louis who had just started the series and it was so hard to talk around the questions without spoiling things for her. Finally, people asked her to put her hands in her ears and, and just, you know, not hear it. But um, for those who haven't gotten to that point, um, Edward having a, a family, I'm trying not to say who it is or how it happened. Um, I think that his Ted persona is a, is a more gentle persona. And I think that in, and, and Edward himself, I think they are merging because he's spending so much time with 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 his family in a gentler thing where you can't be Edward and drop off the kid to ballet class and hang around with the ballet parents. Edward being around them would be overkill and would scare them all. So I, I think it's unintentional on my part, but it I think it's just part of how he's starting to act on a regular basis. And just to kind of follow tag in, because this is something that you and I have talked about. And as you have spent more time around people who have come out of that background and seeing how they adapt and they do with therapy, um, I think is molding how you're adapting, especially your characters that are former teams, former military and Edward, since he's basically Anita's brother. Um, and it's, they're brother growing. Ours, yes. Yeah. And they're growing with their therapy, which I, is, for me as a combat vet, is something to look at. And, and I'm seeing somebody going through what I'm going through. And I think that really speaks to a lot of your fans as well, because they can look at your books and look at the stories that you tell and put themselves in. And it doesn't have to be in Anita's shoes. Um, it could be okay. in Edward or you know, Jean-Claude or... Um, somebody's actually got a question about Asher. Uh, is Asher ever going to change? Yes. And, and if you read Raphael and you're, and finish and getting through and reading Smolder, you'll see that he is changing, that therapy is helping. And um, for Asher, one of the things in talking about therapy is sometimes talk therapy is not enough. Sometimes you really do have a biochemical issue and you need medication from a, from a good professional and Asher, they found he, his, his brain chemistry is off and you can't fix that just talking. So he actually has medication that's helped him get healthier. And uh, it's the first time that a vampire is, they found medication that worked on a vampire, but I wanted to put that out there because I've talked about talk therapy, but medication can be, can help you when nothing else can, but talk therapy plus medication. It's not just medication. You have to do both. It is a, it is a team effort. Um, I want to go back briefly. I, I've been very, uh, very lucky and blessed that police officers and people with military backgrounds have shared their stories with me over the years. 
and um, and it really did change the change the character arc for Anita. Anita leans more towards people who were police officers that talked to me, and Edward leans more towards the military. Um, and they meet in the middle some, but um, and their job though is different from is closer to military than police in many ways for the Supernatural Marshal Service. So I'm I'm seeing this question rolling and rolling, and I guess it's because we started talking about the wedding. Um, and I'm going to absolutely, you know, drive you up the wall with this one. Is Anita ever going to have a baby? I hope not, but maybe. <laughs> um, I've written some some notes and scenes about it, uh, and it would make my job harder. It would make her job harder. It would make, and, and I'm sorry, all of us who've had children, um, you can read all you want and study all you want, as you well know, yeah, that, and it changes everything. It changes so much more than you think it will. Now, at least Anita has enough hands on deck. You would actually be able to trade off as long as she doesn't, as long as she doesn't breastfeed. If you breastfeed, you are a slave, you're a little maternal cow to the children. And I'm sorry, but that, you will hear nothing positive from me about the whole process as a woman, nothing. Hated it, hated it, hated it. I love my daughter, but uh, it, it sucks. And then you have these wonderful little human beings, but it's hard. It's hard to combine parenting and your life. And it, anybody who tells you it won't change after that, they just don't know what they're talking about. They really don't. And so I think it would be a rude awakening, to be honest. If I could do one of those dream sequence books where Anita got pregnant, and then you could undo it at the end where she could say everything I wanted to say about pregnancy and early child, you know, taking care of babies and have all the characters react to it and then not have to keep doing it. I might do it. But once we do it, there's no unringing that bell and the, and the series yeah. will change. Yeah. It, with this many people, I, I just it would be easier and harder. The easier but how would you, you would begin to not be able to have time for everybody again. So we, we asked if Asher will ever change. Will Kane ever change? Well, there's all sorts of ways to change. So yes. <laughs> yes, eventually he will change or people will force him to change. And, and that's all I can say because anything else is a giveaway, but there's somebody who needs therapy and won't get it. Um, will we get to see more, uh, some more of Anita's inner wrath? Uh, we will, we will. I've got, I've got an idea for another book that's heavy on the were rats, and uh, and we will get to see, uh, we will get to see her. I don't want to call it a pet because it's not a pet. Astro's not a pet. The the rat that chose her at. Uh, at the inner sanctum for the were rats, we will get to see him more um, interact with her. But so we will, uh, but not. I, I think I think we're going to have to get through the wedding before we can do that one that book. And y'all in the chat and in the Q and A are doing a fantastic job. Please keep them coming. Uh, is there any specific location you'd like to research for a story that you haven't visited yet? Because I know you did for Crimson Death, you did Ireland. Um, I know for Obsidian Butterfly, you did Phoenix. So uh, Albuquerque. Albuquerque, Albuquerque and Santa Fe. Um, so. I thought about setting something in Arizona, but I went in the summer when when it when when it's so hot, and all I could think of is I don't want to go out in this heat for a whole book. I don't want to. I don't want to be out in this heat. It's it's uh, the thought of fighting or hiking in it for real. I, I think I'll hike a little bit more temperate climate. But um, uh, there are places, I mean, I have a list of countries I haven't been to. I have a list of uh, some of the states I haven't been to here in the U.S. Um, I have enough research and I've been enough times to England. So I have a book set for England uh, in the U.K. I'd love to go back to Ireland. But um, I, 
I don't know when we'll get a chance to. And um, so nothing specific. I have, I have plots, but I don't know where I want them. And sometimes I will have characters who will pick them for me. I've got one set for California. I've got one set for uh, Cape Cod. Um, and certain landscapes I might be looking for. I don't know where Olaf lives. He has to live somewhere. And I'm kind of waiting for him to tell me where he lives, where his home base is. And I suspect strongly that's going to be someplace out west that I haven't been. Uh, I mean, Edward chose Albuquerque in New Mexico, and I'd never been there. And he told me he lived there. And I argued with him. I said, you can't live there. I've never been there. And I created you. And he says, no, I live in New Mexico. And I said, no, you don't. As soon as I got off the plane, saw those black mountains, I said, damn it, you do live there. You really do live here. And it was so Edward, um, absolutely where he lived. And I'd never been there. So I don't know. It's, 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 uh, it's kind of magic to me that characters I created can have that much of a life of their own, like Edward does. So speaking of Obsidian Butterfly, because you know it's my favorite, um, is Obsidian Butterfly invited to the wedding? No. Well, she's not going to leave her territory. She's, she's old school. She's not going to leave her territory in her base of power. But, but I've been debating on that because... Uh, Jean-Claude has taken blood oath from everybody in the country and they've supposedly come to him. She didn't leave Arizona. I mean, she didn't leave Albuquerque and now you've got me doing it. Um, and I don't really want them to meet. That sounds frightening, but she is going to want closer to the power base. She is going to want to talk to him. So either she's going to have to come to us or we're going to have to go to her. Um, I suspect strongly we'll be visiting New Mexico again. I've got, some, some of the stuff that happened in Raphael book and some of the stuff that happened in Slay and Smolder in the next book after, which I keep just saying without meaning to, um, and some of the research that I did that I didn't get to use is going to lead us back to New Mexico and Obsidian Butterfly. And um, I'm really, her animal to call is jaguars, but because we find out in Raphael that Obsidian Butterfly's magic is, is related to the magic of the were rats of the Rodare. I really want to explore that more, explore the that connection, and um, and see 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 how much the magics know each other, the different systems know each other. Speaking of magics knowing each other, um, and this is actually a really good question. I've never thought about this one. Are the lycanthropes in Anita able to own pets, or do animals freak out around them? I've established early on in the series that that dogs and stuff do freak out on them. Um, I have never had that issue with cats because she's never gone to any place that had a cat indoors. And the only pet we used to see regularly was Mrs. Pringle, who was her neighbor in her apartment at the beginning with uh, with Custard. And Custard freaked out and hated Richard, who is a werewolf. So. Um, uh, you know, but I think cats would be more, more laissez-faire about it. Cats are, cats will just go off and hide until they figure out if you're going to, if you're a, a danger or not. Dogs are more overtly aggressive and have to do something. Um, they don't usually go and hide unless they're from an abusive background. And um, a little dog that's scared will bark and be aggressive rather than hide. And a cat will just hide and figure out what's going on later. Um, but I, we thought about getting a puppy or a dog for Nathaniel. We thought about it. Um, but I just can't imagine, I can't imagine Jean-Claude wanting something to shed all over his clothes. And um, th somebody raised a question just last night that I'd never thought of and is, do lycanthropes shed? Do the theranthropes shed as their animal forms? And they should but I'd never thought about it before. Do they shed? And I'm actually going to be thinking about that. And, <laughs> and, and I, I, I'd looked in some big cat sanctuaries and I know that tropical cats in a cold climate will get winter coats. So they should, they should shed, but since they change form completely, would you, 
Would you have to brush them yourself out? You know what I mean? Would you have to brush so yourself just like out? To, I'd just like to point out, y'all, that this, and I've been friends with Laurel for years, this is how she gets started on research and with ideas. Somebody asks a question and she goes, huh. And I go, well, I don't know. Let me find out. And if there's not information, then I'll take what what's the closest information of real world I can find and use that as a jumping off point. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I'm catching a few comments. Wear leopard hairballs. I you saw know, that one. I, you know, really, really, but only if they lick themselves. If they don't lick themselves, then you won't get a hairball. So and we've never really addressed it. And now, of course, next time, I'll have to address it next book. So, so if yeah. you see it, you absolutely will see it. You'll know. I, I now, you know, just brushing each other, brushing each other's hair rather than licking each other or something. Yeah, something like that. We we so have to follow this up. So kind of getting into the pro the writing process. In your daily life as a writer, do you prefer to write when you're inspired or every time you've decided to? Like, do you have a set time that you sit down and write or do you only write when you're inspired? Uh, if you only write when you're inspired, you will never have a career as a novelist. You might be able to be a short story writer. You might be able to be a poet. But if you're going to be a not... I have, let me put a caveat. I think of a novelist with a career as somebody who writes, brings out one to two books a year. If you only have one brilliant book in you, and there, and, and there have been some, then, then you are a novelist, but you, and you are, and that's never going to go away, but you don't have an ongoing career. When I say career, I think of somebody who's regularly turning out books, because that's how they think. I'm a serious writer, so that's, I want my series to continue. I want to do the next adventure, next story. So, um, you know, uh, I used to say that, you know, inspiration is for amateurs. Professionals go after it with a club. And I'm paraphrasing Jack London on that one. Uh, you sit down at your desk and you kind of condition yourself to be inspired. If you're not inspired, what I do is I will write, I will type on my keyboard. And, and if I'm not inspired, but I'm on deadline, I will sit there and go, okay, why can't I write today? Why aren't I inspired? It's too hot. It's too cold. I'm too tired. I literally bitch and moan for half a page to a page and a half. And then eventually the muse comes in. Um, I think it's Ray Bradbury who said, the muse cannot resist a working writer, but you've got to be working for the muse to find you. Now we've all had the lightning strike muse, the muse that wakes you up in the middle of the night and you go, oh my God, that's a brilliant yeah. idea. Write it down. You will not remember it. No matter how sure you are, if you don't write it down or make a note right then and there, you will not remember it. And do not do, not do code words from your dreams. Write it all out. Absolutely write it all out because tomorrow you'll wake up and you go, what did I mean by that? What does that abbreviation even mean? Don't do it. I've done it. And you're always convinced that you lost a brilliant idea. So good tips for writers. What are your top? So new, uh, new writer, your, your top two pieces of advice. I, I know, I know your first one, but we've got folks that may not have ever heard this. So writers, right. That's the first one. Um, writers, right. Writers are writing. Don't be a writer, be writing. And I'm paraphrasing somebody else a, a longer quote, but um, the more you write, writing is a skill. One of the interesting things about writing is that people treat writing in art, art in general, creativity, they treat it as if you're not struck by the muse of inspiration that you can't do it. And they don't think of it as workmanship and practice like an athletic skill. Um, you do not expect to get behind the wheel of a car the first time and be able to drive the Indianapolis 500 and win, right? Well, writing's the same way. When you first sit down to write, you're not going to be absolutely perfect. It's not going to be brilliant every time. In fact, it will probably be pretty bad. You have to give yourself permission to be bad. You have to give yourself permission to be terrible on paper. And the more you write, the better you'll get. And writing is rewriting. First draft, first drafts are, are just anything you put on paper. Um, my first novel was written uh, two pages a day before work in corporate America, no editing. 
no editing as I went, because if I had to edit, I'd get bogged down. And then if I came to something I didn't know how to research, rather than at that time going to the library, um, I would just put in notes in big cap letters. What does 15th century underwear look like? What does whatever you want, just put it in. My first draft, when it got to where it looked like a book, my second draft was doing, filling in those notes, filling in the research. That was my second draft. Third draft was the first time I started polishing actual writing. So, and the other thing is research, 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 research. The more fantastical thing you want somebody to believe, the better your research in the real world better be because there is an expert on everything, everything. And they will read your book and they'll catch you out and they will let you know. And it will also lose you a reader and lose their suspension of disbelief. I could go on, you know, I could go on. <laughs> oh yeah, we, I, I could get you on this rant going for at least another hour and a half, two hours maybe. What was your Probably. music playlist? What was your music playlist for, for this book? I actually didn't have one. This is the first book I ever could not get music on. It was horrible. I finally, for the first time, wrote this book and the next book to movies and, and TV. I've never done that before. I've never done that before, but I could not settle to any music. Um, I started off doing Grey's Anatomy. I watched so much Grey's Anatomy, I began to do individual episodes and then I branched out. I, I did Kevin Costner's draft day with uh, one of the early things of, uh, of Bozeman's. Uh, so, mm -hmm. and uh, Chadwick Bozeman. And uh, yeah. I did I did the uh, Emma Thompson um, uh, Sense and Sensi No, not Sense and Sensi Sense and Sensibility. Yeah, Sense and Sensibility. And watched that one over and over. I did the uh, another version of that, but. Once you've seen that one, you shouldn't watch another version of that back to back because it's just such a brilliant production. Um, I did uh, I did the gentleman uh, Guy Ritchie's film with yeah. such a brilliant cast. I watched that over and over. I watched every episode of Grimm. Amazing world building, very underrated world building, uh, underrated series. Um, I watched every episode of Tattoo uh, of 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 Ink Master. Every episode, every season of Ink Master. Um, I watched, um, oh, um, The Devil Wears Prada and which, uh, uh, and also uh, Late Night, both uh, older women mentors successful in the field with the young and up and comer. Different mm -hmm. films, but but they kind of complement each other. And um, I watched a few things sporadically, sporadically, sporadically. And but those were the things I watched. I would marathon until I had to go to something else, or I would put them in between each other. Um, and uh, after watching so much Grey's Anatomy, I went off and found Patrick Dempsey movies. Um, uh, like brides, uh, maid of honor, and things like that, and um, uh, it's just really surprising because, and I wonder if that is because was this was this book harder to write, and the the lack of playlist being one of those indicators, or is it just a, I have, a shift? I have no idea. I won't know until I sit down to the next book. Okay. I think I found a album for the next book. But I won't know till I actually sit down to write it and try. Right now, I'm the book I'm writing next, not the next Anita, but the next book I'm writing, I am searching for playlists now. Because when I wasn't listening to movies or, t or watching t TV or movies as background, I was listening to silence. Silence, just no music. It was the weirdest thing. I've never been able to write to no noise before. And that was the other thing I would do. I would go from cacophony of so much noise and activity, and then I would go to silence. And I have no idea. I don't know if it's a change. I won't know till I till I sit down again. Um, and I found out. I've recently found out in the last few years how neurodivergent I am. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, 
I just calcula, just dyslexia. I knew I had those, but that I have more ADHD than I thought I did that, you know, that kind of thing. So I've also realized that part of the problem for me is that my happy brain chemicals only go for so many hundreds of pages <laughs> and then they run out. And so I just want to be done. I want to be out of the book and then I want to start new because that's ha happy brain chemicals again. So mm -hmm. knowing that about myself, I think I will have a better pace for page count and everything of what I want from now on. Okay. Um, will you be circling back to Anita trying to bring the mer people into their full power? Yes. Um, the plot I originally wanted for Cape Cod required me to get in the water and, and diving. I have my dive certificate, but I had a diving accident when I was getting my certificate certification for deep diving. And um, I won't go into the whole full details. Let's just say that I, I went in trying to get rid of my fear of water and came out with claustrophobia and, um, and thought I was actually going to die and not going to make it out. Um, I would not go back to the water for 20 years. I mm -hmm. didn't realize how much it spooked me, but it really did. And um, so I wanted to go diving in Cape Cod so I could see for myself the underwater areas. But in the meantime of dealing with my phobia from the dive accident, I got cold uticaria, which means I break out in hives from cold. And the water around Cape Cod is not that warm. So um, my, I've been told my allergist that I could, if I break out enough hives, I can go into anaphylactic shock and die. So I can't dive for Cape Cod. And I have to change some of the book because I, I don't, there's no way for me to see it now. Um, though there is a submersible in the Cape Cod area that they do do films for, and that might help me, but I would still not be get the authentic experience that I wanted to get with yeah. them. But, but yes, we are going to follow up on that. I just, I cannot follow up on it the way that I had planned. So I have to change the story. I mean, you could get somebody to dive it for you and take a GoPro down there. It's not the same. I always miss it's, stuff. I always miss stuff true. if I don't do it myself. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm seriously, there's a submersible in the area that they take pictures mm -hmm. of. So, um, so that would be just as good as that and everything. Nobody will notice what I'll notice. You know what I mean? Um, nobody notices the same things. So. So are you surprised by the way that Jean-Claude is involved? And actually I'm going to, I'm going to shift this question a little bit. The question is, are you surprised by the way that Jean-Claude has evolved knowing he was supposed to die at the beginning of the series? And on that, are you surprised at the evolution of the series that it's taken? Um, I'm surprised the evolution of the series in general. Jean-Claude was supposed to die at the end of three, the Circus of the Dam. Mm -hmm. But when the moment came Jean -Claude, for Jean-Claude to die, Anita and I both realized we'd miss him. and It was too late. Um, but at book three, I thought he would take the series in a direction I didn't want to go if he survived and I couldn't kill him. And he did exactly what I thought he would do. He took the series in a direction I didn't plan. And, um, think how different it would be if he had not made it past book three. I mean, so oh, different. Yeah. Um, so once I didn't do that, <laughs> you know, I, I knew we were going to head unknown territory after that. And we certainly did, uh, I am very happy that we did it this way, but but no, I had no idea. Jean-Claude, if you read the early books, is almost, he's not just the bad boy, he's almost the villain. He's like, he treads that line. But then yeah. so does Edward at the beginning. I never thought that Edward would be Anita's best friend. Never in a million years thought Edward would turn into a continuing character and have such a character arc as he does. I mean. You can't be a bad guy if you're uh, you're the only one that can operate a flamethrower inside safely and get your friend out, and burn a house down around you. So <laughs> it wasn't done safely. They got out, but it wasn't done safely. There was no way to do that safely. Uh, but as did they said, survive? Any landing you walk away from is a good landing. Yes, I, I know. No, 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 no. A good landing is a landing you walk away from. A perfect landing is one where you can use the aircraft again. I didn't say it was a perfect landing. The house was burned to the ground after they got out. So the house is gone, but they survived and bad guys died. So it didn't kill them. So there you go. Um, no, Edward, 
Edward, Edward's, you know, a lot of favorite character for a lot of people. And um, uh, certainly not where I expected he would be at this point in the series. Will we see more of uh, Grandma Flores and hear about Anita's other side of the family? We are going to see more of Grandma Flores uh, later. But first, we have to deal with her father's side of the family. That's enough. That's enough. They are a handful enough on their own. Um, we will be seeing some more of, of her mother's side of the family, the Flores. Um, and um, I think before Grandma Flores comes on scene, that we'll probably see a cousin or somebody coming to see to, to check on her first, I think. Um, we'll, we'll be getting more side, that side of the family, but I don't know when. I don't know when. So kind of speaking about family members and, you know, we've talked a little bit about Edward. Will Peter end up following in Edward's footsteps? I don't know. He's really enjoying the preternatural biology classes that he's taking. And, um, and, you know, he might end up, he might end up going that route, but, um, and also I can't say that you would have to have at least read the first part of this book for me not to have spit, make that a spoiler. Um, Circumstances may choose for him. And, but I do have, but, but I did realize, I do have the idea of him coming and being a summer intern for his biology class with Anita. Cause she's, she's per natural biology uh, with that. And, um, and being able to do an internship for the per natural biology part by following either Edward or, um, or Anita around because you get to see uh, you can get to see the supernatural stuff that you study in college on you get to see them and interact with them for real. Uh, the preternatural biology, uh, the the preternatural marshals actually probably see more of some of these than the biologists do because the biologists will uh, interact with the safer things that aren't going to probably eat them right away. Right. So I do have an idea of Peter coming to spend a, at least a few a month or two in St. Louis as an intern for getting college credit. Do you have anything you'd go back and change in any of the Anita books if you could? Um, no, not really. Um, I'm I'm a big one for thinking forward, going forward. Um, I would put a book in between. I would put a book in between book book eight, which is Blue Moon, and uh, book nine, which is Obsidian Butterfly. I would put a book between. And I would have the book in between be Richard and Anita trying to get married. Because if you read book eight, Blue Moon, it seems to set up um, set up for them to be try to get married. And, mm -hmm. and so I would have a book in between showing what went wrong and why that didn't happen. There will be some mystery involved in some kind of other plot, but, but it would be showing that relationship and what happened and how they ended up not marrying and what happened there. Um, because it was, it was pretty abrupt going from eight to nine to 10. But until I read them all over in order uh, during lockdown, I didn't see that. I didn't see that it was such an abrupt change for some of the fans. In my head, I, I knew what happened, but I didn't put it down on paper, which um, I am getting a chance to put down on paper in these next two books, some of it, interaction between them. So speaking of Richard, there's a question here. The question is, will Richard and Anita ever take the fourth mark? But for that to happen, other things need to take place. So is Richard gonna get his head I'm not going to swear. Will Richard get his head out of his butt? Um, yes, he will get his, he will get his, he will, he, his therapy, he's making progress on his therapy. And that's all I can say without giving stuff away. Uh, are we going to learn more about Anita's and Raphael's relationship, which I mean, it's Raphael. So I want to know this question too. We are. And we do get to see more of that, not in this book, but the book after, but um, the next book after that. But um, 
when we do the book that I'm working on putting together about um, the mat, uh, some of the stuff we learned in Raphael and exploring that more, mm -hmm. we are going to get to see him more on stage. Though it may be more about the Brujas and Anita and um, the magic, which is not really what Raphael does. Mm -hmm. So Raphael will be in there, but he's not, he's not a mat. He doesn't do the magic himself personally. He's just, okay. um, I, no, I have to stop now because I'll give something away. <laughs> okay. So why does Anita love penguins so much? The honest answer is that um, I was writing the, the first book and I thought, I want to give her a stuffed toy, a comfort object. And, um, and I looked around at that time. I, I collected teddy bears at that time. I don't anymore. I uh, haven't for years. But I had friend, one friend had gifted me a penguin. One friend had given me a penguin. So it's this, this little shelf of teddy bears, one penguin. And I thought, that's different. It's different. Let's make it a penguin. So I didn't really have a thing for penguins until I gave Anita a thing for penguins. And now I've had so many people gift me penguins over the years. And, and I've become interested in penguins because Anita is interested in penguins. That's how it came about. It's simple as that. I didn't want to give her something as trite as a teddy bear. So she got a stuffed toy penguin. All right. So last question, because we just got the wrap up message. When is the next book coming? The next Anita Blake coming? Uh, the Smolder, you have in your hot little hands, Slay. Can I, I can say the title, right? Yes. Okay, Slay. Ah, without Slay is coming in November. You're getting Slay in November, the next book. So Smolder here, and then book 30, Slay, is coming in November. So you get the 30th Anita Blake novel in the 30th anniversary year. And I'm so happy for that. And fantastic job. Congratulations on finishing 30 in 30 years, um, along you. with everything else you've done. Um, folks, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I would like to remind you that your signed books will be mailed after the event. Um, they'll arrive in about eight to 10 business days. Um, all of Laurel's titles are available at Barnes & Noble and at barnesandnoble.com. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Laurel, thank you for sitting down and talking with me tonight. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure and an honor. It's always fun for us to do these. Uh, and I look forward to the next time that we can do something. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for handling the questions. And thank you to everybody that joined us and got to talk and interact. And I look forward to the next time. And maybe we can do this again in November.